Welcome to the Life Unlimited Podcast with Larry Heller. You deserve complete financial advice so you can confidently live your life your way for life. Now, let's get into this week's podcast episode. Hello and welcome to Life Unlimited with Larry Heller from Heller Wealth Management. I'm Larry's producer, Eric, and I'm here to learn along with you, the audience. Larry, what's going on? Oh, hi, Eric. Oh, another day as we get into March. Uh, Spring is soon coming, although we had a first snowfall of the year today. Yesterday. (laughs) I know that's hard to believe with you out in Nebraska, but here in New York, it was our first snowfall. Wow. Wow. Okay. Well, are you going to go sledding, skiing? No. Anything? No, not that no, much snow. Avoid it. Yeah, just it's not going to be <laughs> just, that much. Just a couple inches. All right. Well, I know you got another guest on the show today, and that is Philip Siegel. And Philip opened Charles Griffin Intelligence in 2009, specializing specializing in complex financial investigations, and has worked as an investigator since 2006. Prior to opening up his firm, he worked for 19 years as a journalist in India and Pakistan, and then became a finance specialist in Asia. He is the author of The Art of the Fact Investigation, Creative Thinking in the Age of Information Overload, and has written more than a dozen articles for law journals and other legal publications on how to investigate ethically. I like that part, ethically. Um, Larry, this sounds like a fantastic guest. Uh, Philip and I got to talk just barely before the the show started, but what are you guys going to talk about today? So we're going to talk about what does an investigator do and why you may need one. Okay. I look forward to it. Philip, thank you for joining us today. and Welcome to the show. Thanks, Larry. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So I, I thought when I met Philip that I was intrigued kind of what Philip does. So I thought our audience may be intrigued not only what they what he does, but um, where they may need his services. So why don't we just jump right in, Philip, and kind of tell, tell everyone what does an investigator does and why you may need one? Well, there are a lot of different kinds of investigators, the way there are a lot of different kinds of you know, lawyers in the world and doctors in the world. Um, I do mostly financial investigations. And so I specialize not so much in following people, in in figuring out if you've been hacked at your computer. Uh, I, I, I do more, what is a person's financial situation? What do they own? Who are their allies? Who are their enemies? Uh, What's their history? Sometimes if you're going to invest a lot of money with somebody that you don't know very well, uh, then you want to know, does this person get into trouble? Does this person get sued by his partners all the time? Does he close deals? Uh, Does he leave people hanging? So even if it's not a matter of a a divorce asset search, which is something I do quite a bit, I do a lot of work for investors who just want to know, how am I... What is it going to be like to be married in a business sense to this person? Or I've already been married to this person in a business sense. It didn't go well. I'm suing him. And now I need to find out what he's got that I could go get. Because in America, if you sue someone and you win, but you can't collect anything, then you don't really win. So that's the kind of thing. It's mostly people's stories regarding business and finance. That's, uh, I guess. Okay. The, so it's uh, not like when we watch on TV and we see these private investigators and you're following them all over the place. That's not what you do, right? No, I would make a boring TV show because I, I sit right at this uh, set of computer screens that I'm sitting at right now. And I look at things all day and I come sometimes call people and once in a while I'll go out and talk to them. But most of the time it's, it's looking at the, reading things and uh, perhaps calling people. And so it doesn't translate into a really action-packed, hour-long uh, show. <laughs> okay. So, so Philip, how did you get into the business? I was a journalist, as as uh, Eric mentioned in the introduction, uh, and I was a, a finance editor at the Asian Wall Street Journal in Hong Kong, and I wanted to get a little more information, a little more knowledge about law, because I found that I had gotten a fairly good sense of how businesses report their earnings, and I could talk to analysts about their assumptions for how a company was going to perform, and I could pick holes in some of their assumptions. But when it came to reading legal cases, I had no idea what I was looking at. 
there was Latin and I, I just I just didn't know. And if I was writing about a legal controversy, I had to call lawyers and say, well, which side do you think is going to win and why? And I would have no idea if the lawyers were talking through their hat or what the lawyers were talking about. So someone said, why don't you go to law school for one year on one of these fellowships and mm -hmm. learn more about law? So I did that and I liked it so much. And people there talked me into the professors, talked me into getting a whole law degree. Uh, instead of going back to the Wall Street Journal after one year, and I said, I don't, I don't want to practice law. I don't know any happy lawyers. I, I know some now, but a lot of lawyers don't really like what they do. And at the law school, they said, doesn't matter. You can do anything you want with a law degree. It's a very uh, flexible kind of thing to have. It's good knowledge. So I did it. I went and I got a law degree. And then at midlife, because I had been a journalist for twenty years. I found out that no one really wanted a middle-aged first-year associate at a New York City law firm. That's where I was mm -hmm. had transferred to go to law, finish law school. So I had heard about investigation, and I tried it. I got a job in with a firm, and I, I figured out quickly that this is really the job for me because it involves some of the the guesswork and the digging around in in alternative kind of places you know maybe it's this way maybe it's that way when you're a reporter you don't really no one's telling you go look here go look there you're just trying to figure it out and you don't have a badge and you don't have subpoena power you just have to talk to people maybe they'll be nice to you uh and uh, they'll be you know if if you and if you're nice to them they'll probably be nice to you as opposed to saying you have to talk to me because i'm you know I have this subpoena right here which i i don't have so i I found that the combination of needing to know about law and needing to know about finance uh, made me not a bad investigator, and um, I liked it. So I continued doing it, and after working for a couple of different firms, I opened this one. And uh, I've just been doing it ever since. So is most of your investigating really kind of Google search? or Well, Google is a very small but important part of any search. Um, I tell people if you, and we've all done this, if you Google yourself, uh, and we've all, let's face it, we've all, we all do it. We, you know, how, how well known am I? Mm -hmm. How much of what you know about yourself is on Google? Uh, unless you're an extremely famous person, an Elon Musk type of famous, or Bill Gates or somebody like that, um, you know, you, you, it's maybe 1% of everything you know about yourself, everywhere you've ever worked. Everybody you've had a fight with, everyone you ever dated, everywhere you've ever lived, uh, all the cars you've owned, you don't you don't see all that stuff on Google. You see very little. So Google does have some interesting things about some of us, but it doesn't have a lot of the total. So then where else do you look? And that's where I come in. Uh, there are some databases that I that I have that that are starting points, but I do a lot of public record searches. I I find out. Um, where do you own a house? Is there a mortgage? Did somebody sue you? And and on and on. And 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 in securities filings, did you participate in a in an offering? Uh, is there a uh, is there a form D filing for your pr uh, private placement for your company? So anything like that? Uh, that's not going to generally be on Google. What Google is good for, and I like to think of Google as as the the friendly reference librarian you used to go ask when you were in high school or middle school and you had to do a report about, I don't know, the lobster fishery in Maine. You know, the librarian doesn't know how many lobsters are caught in Maine every year, but mm -hmm. the librarian would say to you, why don't you go over there and look at the Maine yearbook? We have every state's yearbook over there or the uh, how about the Department of Fisheries the national and the Department of Fisheries yearbook will have that statistic in it. And so they Google is very good at telling you where to go to keep looking for what you want, as opposed to giving you the answer right away. And that, and so it's it's very useful, but it's with only Google, it would be like trying to build a house with just a hammer. Right. So I guess there are other, these other websites actually yesterday. Uh, our custodian wanted to verify me and they sent a whole list of questions of what cars did I own or not own from 10, 15, where I lived. And it went back pretty far and you had to pick the right one that you've in order to move on. So I guess those are the kind of databases you're referring to. 
Some yeah, but I I'm not allowed to see uh, a lot of car ownership unless I have a permissible purpose. Mm -hmm. um, if if you have if you're doing a credit, someone's checking your credit, then you give them the the permission to really delve into a lot more information. If I'm working for someone who wants to sue you and they don't have a judgment yet or anything like they're just wondering if it's worth suing you, I'm not allowed to go look at your bank accounts and your credit report without your permission. So I can only look at what's publicly available. And public information is, you know, houses, mortgages, lawsuits, but not every lawsuit because, you know, divorces are sealed in in New York and some other states. Um, I can see that someone gets divorced, but I can't see the substance of what goes on in the in the fight and I can't see what the divorce settlement is whereas in other states that's all wide open. So the the definition of of what's public and what's private varies not only you know, across the different states here but across countries too. Hmm. And so if you're searching in Norway, in Norway everybody's income is public. You can look up what what people earn. That's all public information. But, you know, in in most of, of Europe, I can't look at any kind of court filings. Like yeah, that would be an interesting thing to have here in the U.S. to be able to look up at everyone earns. Well, everybody's definition of privacy is different, and uh, you know, I know Europeans who say, "I, I couldn't believe, I can't believe that you could look up someone's divorce decree in in Maryland and see, you know, what they own and mm -hmm. uh, who got what and all that." That's deemed to be private mm -hmm. in New York, and in and in California, and certainly, in, you know, in most of Europe. And here we say, no, that's open. And mortgages, open. Uh, purchase prices of homes, that's public in a lot of places, not in Texas. Texas, you don't put it on the, you can see what place is valued, but Texas has this custom. They don't put the purchase price, none of your business, what you what, hmm. what Tex paid for his ranch. You can yeah. see what it's valued at. But it's, so the, the, uh, the nice thing about America is there's lots of information, mm -hmm. but it, it's um, in all different places, and and there are different rules for what you can get and and where you have to go to get it. Which of the three thousand one hundred counties and parishes stores that information, and what mm -hmm. can you get in each one? That's the, the the difficult part. So, is there information that you're privy to that necessarily wouldn't be a, if someone as a civilian could access? Uh, all I can get. Uh, there are some databases which, with a permissible purpose, I pay for, and those generally don't give you much. They they will uh, they will assimilate a lot of public records. What they mm -hmm. what they will have will be some phone numbers sometimes, uh, which is you know sometimes useful if you're looking for someone. But what they do is they it, it, depending on the permissible purpose that you are using, like if you're doing a fraud investigation or you're looking to help serve someone with legal papers. Uh, you can say that's why I need this, mm -hmm. and then sometimes what they'll do is they'll take information from the top of someone's credit report. So they won't say here are his bank accounts, here are his credit card accounts, and here are his balances, but they will take the phone number off his credit report and say this is his phone number. And you can, and sometimes it's wrong, and sometimes it's right, but a lot of times it's more just a a shortcut for figuring out which places he's lived. So that I can then go and verify with public records that it's true. Hmm. Because a lot of these databases make mistakes. The Westlaw thinks that I still own my house that I sold uh, 13 years ago. And the reason they think that is that when I moved into that house, I got a discount card at, at my local grocery store. And, they, and you write down your address and your phone number. And um, I continue to use that discount card uh today even though i don't live there anymore i put the old phone number in i don't even use the card I just enter my phone number and i get my discount at the drugstore and the and the and the, and the grocery store and so the grocery store and drugstore sell that information to these database uh companies and the database thinks that since i'm still using that card i must still live in that house even mm -hmm. though another database will report to you that i sold that house and so, and the databases don't talk to each other. So that's where a person needs to say, okay, uh, either this guy owns two houses and rents the other one out, or maybe this is wrong. And so, mm. what you would do if you were looking at me is you'd go 
to the one from 13 years ago and you'd go to the county website and, and make sure that I still owned it. Or you'd go to the tax assessor and see who is the owner of record of that house. And they would find that it, I don't own it anymore. So that's so there's a lot of database error. Hmm. And um, uh, I tell people if if the you know with if you're talking about an artificial intelligence, there's a long way to go before you can trust uh, a, a bot to assimilate what's in these databases and give you a report. Hmm. And you mentioned, for, I think you briefly mentioned we talk about privacy laws, but does that affect kind of what you do and and the information that you find? Uh, yeah, because I'm not allowed to get certain things that, that are protected by privacy laws. So, for example, bank accounts. People, once or twice a week, someone calls me up and says, okay, I'd like you to do an asset search, and I need bank account information. I want to know how much money they have in the bank and where the money is, and brokerage records. I want I want to know what they have in brokerage accounts. And I say, I can't get that. I'm not allowed. There's a federal law mm -hmm. against doing that for a very good reason, because you know, if I want to, if you want to hire me, and and you say to me, how much do you charge? Uh, if if I could just look in anyone's bank account for fun, I could look in yours and find out what you paid your other investigator last year, mm -hmm. and come in at eighty five percent of that, and you'll say, wow, this guy's less expensive, even if I was going to charge you even less, uh, you know, before I looked at that. So we don't want other people looking in our bank accounts, mm -hmm. and and the system is a good system. I'm not allowed to look. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't people who do it, because if you pretend, if I pretend to be you, these databases can sometimes give me portions of a social security number or a whole social security number. And if I can assemble a bit of information about you, I could call a bank up and pretend to be you. And that's what a lot of these places do. It's illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact they don't get prosecuted a lot mm -hmm. is too bad, but it, it's still illegal. Mm. So I tell people, you know, I can't do it. And they say, but my investigator mm -hmm. two years ago did it. And I say, well, would you, would you like me to get you some cocaine at the same time? That's also illegal. Would you mm -hmm. like to set up a business in North Korea? These are, these things are also illegal. And even mm -hmm. if I could do it, you would, you would say, no, don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's not allowed. Right. So those are, bank accounts is a big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's a whole other uh, area that, that I have to be careful about because I work mostly for lawyers and there are ethical rules that bind what lawyers can do. And so even if something is legal, it may not be ethical for a lawyer to do. For example? Calling someone up and pretending that I'm rising legal stars magazine. Mm. To, hey, I'd like you to tell me all about this lawyer. Mm -hmm. He's your friend. I'm, And they say, who are you? I'm with rising legal stars and he seems like a great guy. And his friend says, yes, he is. He says, yeah, tells me all about him. Turns out I'm working for the other side of mm -hmm. the case. That's not allowed. And there was an a investigator firm that did that very thing uh, in, in a Harvey Weinstein related case. And the judge was not happy. Not happy at all. That's fraud. Can't do that. So uh, you, you may not do that. Now, if a newspaper does that, uh, if you, uh, they probably could get away with it. You can't impersonate. It's 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 a crime to impersonate law enforcement. No one's allowed to say this is the New York City Police Department mm -hmm. if they're not. But you know, uh, some investigators will stretch a little bit, use fake names, mm -hmm. and and you're really not supposed to do that. Mm. So we, we we touched about it when we first started a talk at the podcast um, that you know you would work sometimes for investigating business partners and and just to check them out. But why don't you give our audience some of the other areas that somebody may be interested in hiring an investigator? Well, so I do a bit of a um, fair amount of intellectual property work. So lawyers can call me up and they'll say, hey, my client has this business and uh, he wants to name it this, or he's named it this, and he's been in business for three years. We've just discovered this other business with the same name. Uh, and we need to figure out who was using it first. Because the trademark, it's a matter of who's using it first as opposed to who registered it first. Mm -hmm. That's a, And so are they still in business? And if they are, did when did they start using this? And have they used it consistently? Did they drop off from using it and then start again? Uh, and that requires a lot of research. Uh, you can newspapers, news releases, internet archive searching, interviewing people, interviewing that business, interviewing other people. Um, and those are fun, fun cases. 
Uh, so we do we do a fair amount of that and some copyright work as well. I occasionally, you know, will get a guy into a mm-hmm. warehouse with a camera to take mm-hmm. pictures of contraband. Uh, that's one of the areas where you are allowed to uh, lie a little bit and pretend, you know, you have a business and you want to buy the, these fake handbags because if there's the there's no other way to prove that someone wants to sell you contraband except to try and buy it. Mm. Uh, so that's one that's a different area, but different kind of legal ethical stricture. So that's so that's intellectual property, uh, and then there's there's plain old just figuring out who somebody is on the other side of a case. So or who someone is, uh, you know, someone's uh, the other day, someone said to me, I have a client who got a knock on the door from FBI agents, but uh, he doesn't think they're really FBI because they showed their they flashed their badges at, at, at the camera, you know, at the entrance to the building. But then when they came upstairs, they didn't show their their ID cards or the badges again. And um, so this lawyer said, well, I want to find out. uh would this person have any reason for someone to be chasing them who isn't FBI? Mm. And um, for, for various reasons, they wanted to know that. And I found out, yes, there's a reason. This person uh, defaulted on a large lawsuit, million-dollar lawsuit, 10 years ago. And so it went back to my client. My client went back to that person. That person said, oh, well, that was a long time ago. And anyway, the case was dismissed. And I said, well, yeah, the case was dismissed because you didn't show up. It was... <laughs> they defaulted, you know. So anyway, um, so I, um, whether there's a judgment or not, I don't know. But it, it's not clear that they ever had to pay the money back. And I said, if they still owe the money, yeah. And these were not particularly nice people that that had lent them the money. So I said, that's that's a good reason. So th- sometimes there's just different when you mm-hmm. need to know a person. So right. people call me and they'll say, my. Um, my son is investing with his father-in-law and we want to make sure that he's not in the mafia. We, you know, we, he went and he got married to this mm-hmm. nice girl and everything. But now he actually might be going into business with the family and we're a little upset that we don't know more about how this person made his money and okay. is he part of organized crime. So I've had a couple of cases where they ask you, can you figure out if someone's in organized crime? In this case, mm-hmm. uh, the guy wasn't. Uh, I was pretty sure... He mm-hmm. certainly wasn't in the the Cosa Nostra because he turned out not even to be Italian. He had changed his mm-hmm. name, so he wasn't Italian. So, that, so they they were happy about that. Uh, but other times, it's you know, my daughter is dating this guy who's double twice her age, and you know, who is he? We we mm-hmm. have no idea. Or and sometimes wealthy families will say, our widowed father has this. He's eighty, and he has a forty two year old girlfriend. And she's spending lots of his money, and we're con- we the kids are concerned, understandably. Who is she? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's fine, and sometimes right. it's, well, you know, right. she's taking out get, big round numbers. Do you get involved in divorce cases? I do. I I get involved in about fifteen twenty percent of what we do is divorce related. It's mostly women mm-hmm. or their lawyers thinking their husbands or ex husbands. Uh, have hidden assets from them and that the husband would have said when things were good in the marriage yes we have you know we have five million dollars and then when the divorce happens well he's had a really bad time of it and now he's down to a million and the wife doesn't believe it because Mm -hmm. on social media she sees him with his new girlfriend in you know in the swiss alps skiing Mm -hmm. and expensive places and where the kids come back and say wow you should see you know the car dad bought and uh, and then they 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 say look there it can't be that there's only a million dollars five hundred thousand for me and so so, and sometimes i mean sometimes men have wives investigated and it's and i've done same-sex marriages men men Mm -hmm. women but mostly it's women And so that you you go in and you try and right. find everything you can about mm-hmm. the the guy's life, mm-hmm. and you, you you say to the women, the client, give I have a questionnaire. I say fill out everything you know about him, every address, every phone mm-hmm. number, every company he's ever worked for. And some women really don't know much; they they don't pay attention. The husband conceals all the finances from him. And they they say I really don't know anything. Mm-hmm. Some know a lot. I'm working on a case right now where the woman is incredibly well informed 
about what her husband did and and has provided lots of mm. great leads. Mm. So you then start to go and you you start from the beginning and you mm -hmm. check what they tell you mm -hmm. so that if they say we own four houses, you make mm -hmm. sure they still own them because sometimes the husband sold one. Mm -hmm. So without, re for $1. Without, re without revealing names, is there yeah. one interesting story that comes top of mind that you can share with the audience? Well, the, uh, yeah, the, this was a, this broke my record for, for money found in, in the, in the shortest amount of time. Uh, a woman called me up, was introduced to this woman you know, a year ago, and her husband was a young but retired, very wealthy hedge fund uh, founder, and they lived on Park Avenue in New York, and things were not going well, and she said, I'd like you to see you know, what, what he's got. And the, and the questionnaire had no information on it. She just He had one side company. She misspelled it, and he had been in the background, but a brilliant part of one of these one of these funds that that does computerized high speed trading and they they've been doing it for a long time and mm -hmm. he's very wealthy so uh i start looking and i thought maybe i shouldn't have done this but I, normally i try not to uh over promise i under promise I, well let's see what we can find and then if i find something good they're happy mm -hmm. but in this case i called up this client and i said i in 2 hours i believe i found you 55 million dollars wow. of traceable money Mm -hmm. And this man was so wealthy mm -hmm. that her reaction was, that's all? And I said, <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. And the way I found it, pretty pretty simple stuff. I put his name into uh, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission database. Mm -hmm. Edgar, I have a paid subscription. And you can do uh, keyword searching. And so uh, if you can possibly search broadly, Always search broadly. You know, when mm -hmm. people make mistakes, they search way too restrictively and then you miss things. Uh, but in this case, he had a somewhat, not very unusual, but somewhat unusual enough name. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were about 500 documents with his name on them. And uh, because he'd been a director of a company or something. Anyway, and there were some people with the same name, but I, I found that's that's a manageable number. So there in document number 65 or something, there was his name. On page four hundred and twenty-three of a seven, you know, seven hundred page uh, annual report by let's call it Fidelity Funds, and he had so many shares of one of the Fidelity Funds. He was in a small share class of one of their funds that he had breached the five percent holding limit, mm. and they have to tell you everyone mm -hmm. who has more than five percent. So I've never seen this. I mean, he he's an individual. Number one holder of this class of funds, Harvard Endowment with I don't know, 50, 60, mm -hmm. $70 billion. Number two, California Public Employees Pension Fund. Mm -hmm. Number three, this guy at this wow. apartment on Park Avenue. And he, he it was, it was, you know, that fund had about seven million in it. And this was back in 1998 or something. But I said to her, either it's still there or it's not. And if it's there, it's probably worth a lot more than it was then. If it's not there, you subpoena Fidelity and they'll tell you where it went. And you can start tracing. It went to this bank account, mm -hmm. went to this trust. And you you can you can go to a judge and say, this didn't mm -hmm. just vanish into thin air, Your Honor. He had it. Where is it? You know, so I said to her, and and of course, he probably has other funds mm -hmm. at, at Fidelity. I mean, maybe he maybe he's in other funds where he's not five percent. But he could be four percent of a much much larger fund, so you want to be looking at send broad discovery demands to Fidelity. Right. Um, I yeah. and I said, but the way you might want to look at this is he was either very sloppy in letting letting himself go to the five percent level, or he wants you to see this because this is what he's offering you. He, if he's mm -hmm. worth half a billion, five hundred million dollars, here's fifty five million dollars, and that's all you're going to find. It's really easy to find it. If you want to find the rest, you're going to have to spend millions of dollars. He's had a decade to hide it in layers and layers of offshore companies and trusts. And I said, you're, you're going to need to probably spend a million or two to go find the rest. And maybe 55 million is going to be enough for you. Mm -hmm. Your kids are all grown up mm -hmm. or they're in college or you know, mm -hmm. 55 million for most of us listening to this show would be just fine. We absolutely, in fact, you'd have a lot of, 
Yeah, I don't know, Phil. You know, my, my clients start right below that number. So yeah, do they? Already? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah. I mean, fifty five. So. If, if every if people found out, you know, you have fifty five million dollars, a lot of people that you know never invited you to a, you know, a New Year's party would be inviting you, and you'd have a lot of new friends, and Abs- uh, and you'd have to start wondering who your friends are, and people who win lotteries often say they regret winning them because they don't know who their friends are, and the families yeah. all yell at them that. So fifty-five million would be plenty for most people. I don't know what she decided to do, uh, but I said, "Look, that's that's he may if he's a really smart guy, which he is. He probably he may have just said, here, you mm-hmm. know, uh, okay, this is this is this is right. what you can get.' And and but that was a that's an interesting story. Any uh, yeah. any final words? I mean, we can talk about all these different. I'm always fascinated by some of these stories any final words to the audience out there that you like to say uh when you're investigating you have to be open-minded uh the worst thing you can do is say i know that he has uh only done business in new york because that's what he told me or that's what it's on his linkedin or that's what's on his done in brad street which is all self-disclosed stuff so i'm not even going to look anywhere else that's a mistake. And it's also just as big a mistake as if you find evidence that he's got a Nevada company to say, nah, it can't possibly be him because I know he's already, he's only in New York. You don't know that. If you knew that, you wouldn't need to do an investigation. So don't close the investigation down and 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 narrow it too much. It's human nature to want to do that because you can look anywhere and you can look forever, but you have to be open to a number of different possibilities. And that's the biggest hindrance to some, some people who try and do their own. Awesome. Work. If, if somebody wants to get a hold of you and talk to you about your services, where's the best way for them to reach you? Well, we have a contact form, Charles Griffin, LLC. Um, and you can, you can get on that contact form and, and uh, the question will come right to my mailbox, or you can call the office phone numbers on the, uh, on the, the website. And I commit to trying to get back to people within 24 hours on a, certainly on a week, 24 business day. Hours. Right. And the, the website again is Charles Griffin, LLC.com. Awesome. And people can also, if they want um, look at our blogs, we have two blogs called the ethical investigator and the divorce asset hunter. And you can get to those independently or through the website. Right. And those have contact information as well. Great. Thanks, Philip, for joining us today. Um, hopefully, uh, many of you out there, most of you will not need an investigator. But if you do, now you know where to reach one. So thanks again for joining us today, Philip. A pleasure, Larry. Thank you. Gentlemen, this has been fantastic. Philip, thank you so much. Um, just like you said, I mean, Larry works with me because I have $55 million <laughs> sitting, sitting around. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't need anything else after that. Um, so yeah, that's amazing. It sounds like you have a really fun and, and enjoyable job and you're helping people. So that's great. So thank you so much for what you're doing, Larry. Um, again, you've got a deep bench. You've got some very interesting guests that have come on this show. I think this is one of my favorites right now, to be honest with you. Ah. Um, if folks want to reach out to you, Larry, how do they get hold of you? Yeah, so they can go go to our website, hellowealthmanagement.com, and they can click on Contact Us, and um, you can schedule a free 20-minute financial diagnostic call with me, or you can feel free to call the office, 631-248-3600. Perfect. Gentlemen, thanks again. And of course, our last thank you goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening to the Life Unlimited podcast with Larry Heller. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the Subscribe Now button below. This way, when Larry comes out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. And if you're watching us on YouTube, we'd appreciate a like and a follow there as well. We humbly ask you to share this podcast, rate it, and leave a review, as this actually helps others find the show. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Heller Wealth Management, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time.